voting in a pandemic. Uh, many thanks to John and the Election SOS team. This work is really important. Um, I don't know what the term is for someone who geeks out on journalism but is not a journalist. Uh, I don't know if it's local news enthusiast or uh, paper boy, perhaps, um, but whatever it's called, I am that. Um, I'm personally really grateful for the role that um, everyone here live today and, and, and who's viewing this recording, the role that you're playing in informing people um, about the communities that they shape. And professionally, I can say that your work um, will certainly shape the 2020 election in profound ways. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's objectives, you'll have to uh, forgive me, uh, most of the work that I do is around uh, training. So any PowerPoint has to come with, uh, with training objectives. So today we're just gonna talk about um, understanding the context um, to the to voting location and in-person voting um, and updates that have been made based on the pandemic. Um, you'll be able to hopefully cover in-person voting with an eye to some key dynamics that we'll discuss, such as staffing constraints and systemic challenges, uh, and hopefully be prepared, to, be prepared to communicate clearly with voters before um, election day to help keep everyone safe. We'll talk about some resources that you can reference to um, ensure that you're providing accurate information to uh, the folks that uh, you're engaging with. We'll do that uh, through this agenda. We'll talk about sort of the big picture context. Um, we'll talk about implementing public health guidelines. Then again, get into some of those key dynamics around in-person pandemic voting, um, and then look at a healthy voting resource and have plenty of time uh, for uh, wrap up and Q&A. Uh, thanks to John for the introduction. Before, I'll just say a few more words um, about who I am and the work that I do. I'm the program manager uh, for the training program at the Center for Tech and Civic Life. What I get to do every day is uh, really an honor. I get to listen to local election officials, those 20,000 folks around the country that run the nuts and bolts of elections. And I get to listen to their needs and work with them to build, deliver, and assess trainings that support their pro professional development and their ability to deliver safe, secure, inclusive elections. Um, and then we get to uh, understand the, the impact of that and uh, assess that and repeat, improve and repeat. Um, and so that's, that's really the heart of the work that I get to do is, is supporting the work of election officials. And I will just say that um, it's really an honor to work with election officials. They're some of the most hardworking, service-minded, committed folks um, who are often uh, underappreciated or, or at the very least not in the spotlight for the incredible work that they do across the country. Um, and there, there are certainly lots of really great people working to make US elections work. Um, and I'm just glad to help. So a word about uh, where I'm coming from. CTCL is a nonprofit organization that's on a mission to ensure every American has the information they need to become and remain civically engaged. Uh, we do this in two ways. Like I described a minute ago, the first part of our work focuses on supporting election departments directly, helping them run those safe, secure, inclusive elections. Um, that looks like a lot of different things. We run uh, cybersecurity training for election officials in partnership with the Federal US Election Assistance Commission. We maintain a set of election tools at the aptly named electiontools.org, uh, including a set of open source election icons and graphics that might be useful to you and your teams as you're producing images about the voting process. We support the administrative implementation uh, of policies like automatic voter registration and voting by mail. And we lead a national network of election officials and publish a monthly newsletter highlighting election administration best practices called electricity. Um, and we get to offer trainings on a wide variety of topics, um, including a recent 12 part series on COVID-19 responses for election officials that I'll be drawing on today. The other part of our work, and forgive me for, for taking more than a minute on this, uh, CTCL manages the largest national data sets answering the questions, what's on my ballot and who represents me? We work with Google, Facebook, and other organizations, big and small, to put that accurate election information in front of voters. We also have additional data sets that append that election information with stats like race and gender of candidates and elected officials produced for groups like the Reflective Democracy Project. So that's a little bit about us. We're based uh, in Chicago, though we have folks across the country. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting to partner with Election SOS to be talking to you today. So let's talk about the context for pandemic elections, kind of the big picture here. Um, and I'm gonna focus on three pieces. One, uh, perhaps this is self-explanatory, but the specifics matter. Um, there is a key relationship between vote by mail and in-person voting. And that essentially um, what we're 
what we're seeing is election officials running two simultaneous unexpected elections at the same time. So uh, I joke that the answer to almost every question about election administration in the United States is it depends. And what I mean by that is that uh, because of the federal system, um, basically where most of the power for elections is held by localities and states, over 8,000 different jurisdictions hold election uh, authority, uh, there's very little consistency across townships, counties, states. Um, so it's hard to talk about the US election system as a whole. Um, it really depends on uh, the specific jurisdiction that we're talking about. So an example of that, um, if someone is asking, can I cast my ballot at any voting location in the county, uh, in, in my county, that depends. This map uh, is from the National Vote at Home Institute, um, which is one of the primary organizations that provides technical assistance for implementation of vote at home and, and vote by mail uh, policies. What, it, what the map is showing is that some states um, have a fully vote at home system, which means that voters are automatically sent ballots uh, to their homes without requesting them every election. Um, and you know, the, that ranges back the other direction towards states where you actually require, uh, you're needed to, to provide an excuse um, related to health concerns or other reasons why you'll be out of the, the jurisdiction for election day in order to get and cast an absentee ballot. So the, and then the states range from, from those polls um, across and in between. For some states, especially in those vote at home, uh, jurisdictions like Colorado and Utah and Washington and Oregon, California, Hawaii, um, though everyone sent a ballot, they also have countywide vote centers that allow folks to, um, on election day and often for the week or two before, um, come in person to cast a ballot. And those vote centers are open to anyone in the jurisdiction. Um, there's There are no neighborhood precincts. You don't have to go to the, the church around the corner or the elementary school down the block. Um, you can go to any county. Um, that's not the case in lots of other states, in most other states. Uh, aside from early voting on election day, most folks have to go to um, the one neighborhood precinct that they uh, are assigned to and are unable to vote at other precincts, um, at least through standard methods. So uh, one example of how it depends uh, on, on the jurisdiction, what the voter experience is like. Another question is, uh, do I need to provide identification at the polls? Uh, this ranges significantly from state to state. So uh, this is one example. This is actually uh, just a screenshot from a website uh, here in Cook County, Chicago. Voter ID requirements range state to state, but they also change depending on your circumstances, even within a county. Um, so you can see here that depending on your situation, you might need zero, one or two forms of ID. In different states, ID means different things, whether it's a state issued ID or simply an electric bill with your uh, name and address on it. So again, it's, it's a, a wide range. And what I'm basically trying to say is that uh, the specifics matter. And um, when I say it depends, it, what I'm gesturing toward is the fact that I think is probably pretty self-explanatory to journalists, um, that when we're talking about elections, we have to talk about the specific geographies and the specific communities in play, um, as opposed to as much as possible, uh, making generalizations about um, the, the process as a whole. Another key, dynamic or another key piece of context, I should say, um, about in-person voting for this pandemic is the fact that there's this other type of voting happening and um, the rapid expansion of mail balloting. Um, as you can see in the chart, as the pandemic really um, wound up over uh, the course of the spring, states uh, moved to primarily vote by mail primaries. Um, Georgia, where in 2016, their primary had 2% vote by mail, was 60% in 2020. Um, in Rhode Island, typical 3% vote by mail in the last presidential primary, it moved up to 83%. So what we're seeing is that jurisdictions are seeing 10, 20, even 40 times increases in mail balloting. Um, and that's for good reason. Mail balloting is a really safe option. It's a secure option and one that's been um, tested and uh, utilized in states for decades. 
but not at this scale. And so election departments are scrambling to um, effectively meet this need and build the systems that are required to do this, not just you know, double the amount or triple the amount, but literally 20 or 40 times the amount of, um, of vote by mail ballots. That has a, an effect on the jurisdiction's ability to provide those ballots um, and, uh, and to provide other services, including the other type of voting, in-person voting. So let's talk a little bit about this context of in-person voting. If there's vote by mail, you might wonder why we should keep in-person voting at all. And the primaries were a pretty good test case for um, approaches that focused on vote by mail, but then drastically scaled back options for in-person voting. And it didn't go particularly well. Um, so we saw a number of headlines um, from a number of states about incredibly long lines, three, four, five, six hour lines to vote. Um, certainly not uh, anyone's ideal. And uh, that's really because of the, the shrinking of the footprint of in-person voting. So vote by mail systems cannot necessarily accommodate the full electorate in many states. Um, so that's one reason why in-person voting is important. It's also a fallback for when overwhelmed vote by mail systems um, can't deliver ballots if needed. So we've seen that in places like New York where folks requested absentee ballots but weren't able to get them um, and then showed up at the polls on election day. Um, people also have a, some people have a strong preference and trust for in-person voting. Um, and that's, uh, especially true in some historically marginalized voting groups. So for instance, black voters, um, there have been surveys done that, that overwhelmingly black voters prefer in-person voting and trust it more. Um, and so major tweaks to the election system, asking people to vote by mail or uh, to vote in person, those are, uh, those are changes that have implications for the electorate and who's enfranchised, who trusts the process um, and who's not. It's also true that in-person voting is really important um, for folks that are not well served by the mail system, which includes um, some Native American groups. And it's uh, really useful for people uh, with some disabilities because in-person voting provides um, technology to assist in the voting process that's necessary. Um, so in-person voting serves a lot of roles um, even in the context of a pandemic. And so election departments are really trying to get it right. A quick note about what in-person voting looks like. Again, let's get, get into the specifics here. In-person voting can look like your traditional neighborhood precinct, right? I vote uh, when I vote in person at the church on the corner of my street. Um, you might vote in the local community center or the cafeteria of a school um, or a number of other different community locations. That's typical, right? Increasingly, because of poll worker shortages, we'll see combined precincts. So essentially, multiple neighborhood precincts just in one big gymnasium um, or one place where you can use fewer poll workers to manage more people. There's also, of course, uh, in some states, early voting sites and super centers, which um, allow for um, folks to cast their vote before election day and to do it in a centralized location. We're also seeing things like arena voting. So uh, this is pretty new. This is a, a 2020 uh, trend that large uh, athletic groups, uh, large sporting groups are uh, turning over the keys to their stadiums and arenas to serve as polling locations. Um, this provides uh, more resources, uh, often more staff, more spacing, more social distancing space available. Um, but it also presents some challenges. Um, the more centralized the election experience, the, the more risk there is for it being disrupted. People will also be going into their local clerk's office. The clerk is usually the, the local official that runs elections in your township or county. Um, they'll be going into clerk's offices to request ballots, um, to update registration, and sometimes to request and vote an absentee ballot in person. And then there's drive-through voting. Um, so just like COVID testing where you might drive through, um, get swabbed and, and move on. Um, there are approaches where people are driving through to vote um, and we'll see that more um, as a, an in-person approach to voting that is perhaps a little bit, um, perhaps a little bit more safe. 
what all this means is that essentially election officials are conducting two parallel elections, um, a vote by mail election that's 10, 20, 40 times as large in some cases as, is, as was anticipated, and then uh, an in-person election that looks very different, like we'll talk about in a minute because of the pandemic. Um, and so these are two elections where officials didn't really have a chance to plan for the specifics of either. Um, and planning is most of the work that happens um, for elections. Um, they're running them with very little practice. Um, the primaries in some states were good test runs um, for understanding pandemic voting, but uh, the, the general election is a much larger election, um, much higher volume and um, much more complicated logistics. And so um, people are sort of doing this without a dry run. And of course, they're doing this uh, while they're managing other parts of their office. In most jurisdictions in the country, the election official is actually uh, also the official for a number of other pieces of city business. So they might be issuing uh, wildlife and hunting licensure. They might be managing real estate uh, transactions. They might be keeping death records. Um, a, a whole range of um, options that they also have to keep doing um, all the while while trying not to get sick. So there's huge stresses on the system. And, you know, so this is in some ways a story about democracy, but also a story about bureaucracy um, and what can be expected um, from, from a bureaucracy in a time of crisis. Um, it's also because of all of these changes, because of um, how important these elections are. This is also a story about communications and the ability for both local uh, election groups, local election offices, I should say, um, state officials, as well as community groups and institutions like, like newspapers and other forms of journalism um, to effectively communicate the changes um, and the reasons for those changes to voters so that they can effectively vote and have faith in the system that they're casting their vote as a part of. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the specifics of um, how election offices are implementing public health guidelines. So what you would expect to see uh, in municipal elections in the lead up to the fall and in the general election in the fall. So obviously this is a, a major concern. Many of you have seen these headlines uh, or similar ones or even written them. Um, I'm assuming all of you are here, um, you know, hoping that you don't have to write this headline, right? Um, so local officials are, are trying to do uh, a lot to make that the case. One way that they're thinking about it is uh, through the lens of the hierarchy of controls as described by the Center for Disease Control. So the, well, I should say, unfortunately, really, the most effective controls like elimination and substitution are unrealistic with COVID-19 for in-person elections. Um, vote by mail accomplishes some of these uh, more effective approaches, but election officials are left with three means of control uh, when it comes to in-person voting. That's engineering controls, isolating people from the hazard, which looks like, for instance, good ventilation in polling locations and administrative controls and PPE, which is changing the way people work and protecting them in that process. So that's things like plexiglass barriers, sneeze guards, social distancing, masks, um, and other uh, types of, of PPE that you would expect to see. So here are some examples of what that looks like, right? Um, a couple of jurisdictions here with plexiglass barriers, uh, election workers in masks and PPE. Um, in the picture on the right, uh, we're seeing folks socially distanced and separated by sneeze guards. Um, so really changes to the process um, that are intended to keep both workers and voters safe. The CDC guidelines for polling places are um, similar to what you'd expect uh, for other places that see large volumes of people. So maybe like a grocery store or something like that. Uh, the guidelines include replacing shared objects. So uh, whereas in the past you might have marked your ballot with a pen and then given that pen back, um, no one wants you to give that pen back anymore. So uh, replacing those shared objects with single use 
single use objects, um, providing ventilation, as I mentioned, modifying lay layouts to provide for social distancing, longer lines, um, creating physical barriers, and then disinfecting voting equipment. Local election offices are also um, ramping up their, their efforts to communicate with voters um, and, and the key constituencies that they work with. So this is an excerpt from a fact sheet for election workers from the Oregon Secretary of State talking through some frequently asked questions about um, how the, the Secretary of State and the, the local election authorities are keeping voters and election workers safe. This graphic is a, a great example of a partnership between the Virginia Department of Elections and the Virginia Department of Health. And um, this is a voter facing graphic um, that reminds folks about key, uh, key requirements at the polls. Um, and it can be shared on social media and printed and posted at polling locations. Um, and so you'll see these types of reminders in polling locations. Uh, this is a, just a quick example of, these are stills from a video out of Rochester Hills, Michigan. The video covers 10 steps that election offices are taking to provide a safe space for voters to vote. Um, they outline, for instance, that all staff will wear PPE, booths will be cleaned after every voter, and encouraging voters to wear masks and try to avoid peak times for voting to minimize crowded polling locations. So another example of um, the types of communication approaches that, that some election offices are, are able to muster to help uh, keep voters informed. So let's go ahead and move on to talking about key dynamics of in-person pandemic voting. We've covered some ground already, focusing on the context of the November election, you know, that it's specific to individual jurisdictions, that there's this rapid increase in mail balloting, um, that in-person voting uh, or lack thereof can contribute to lines, disenfranchisement, and losses in voter confidence. We've talked about how election officials are essentially running two elections side by side, um, and that they're doing it in the context of a pandemic, of course. And we've talked about just a second ago how the CDC suggests election departments respond and the ways that uh, departments are communicating with the public. I thought it could also be useful to highlight some of the key dynamics that are showing up across the country in this context. Um, during primaries, municipal elections, which are happening throughout the summer and early fall, um, and in preparation for the general election. So key dynamics of in-person pandemic voting. Uh, space, staff, stuff, uh, like PPE, systems, and voters. I'm gonna take each dynamic one by one and try to provide some specific examples. So let's start off with space. We are not talking about outer space. Uh, we are talking about the actual spaces where people vote in person, um, whether it's a precinct polling location or arena voting, um, any, of those, any of those options. Essentially, more space is needed. Um, the, the requirements for social distancing uh, in a self-explanatory way uh, require more space. And that means that some voting sites that have been used previously are too small. Um, it's also true that uh, contributing to fewer options is the fact that some prior polling locations are declining to work with election offices this year, um, citing concerns about the pandemic. When sites are continuing this year, they're sometimes charging significant cleaning fees that can add add up significantly, um, $750 or $1,000 or more per site. Um, and if you're managing 10 or 100 or 1,000 sites, that's uh, pretty expensive pretty fast. Um, this is one example of increased costs to election departments that have yet to be offset by federal, state, or local expenditures to a significant uh, amount. Um, and they, these expenses likely won't be offset. Uh, in many cases, local officials have also had to redirect resources from the upcoming election in the fall to the spring, uh, the elections that we just went through, uh, to pay for changes to the primaries. So all of this results in a, a changing set of voting locations for voters, um, and that inconsistency in physical locations across elections uh, can re really result in voter confusion. Um, if you've gone to the same local precinct uh, location, the church down the corner or the school down the street uh, for 10 years, and then suddenly that's not the right location, that prevents uh, some people from, from voting in a, in a timely manner. Um, it's also, it can be challenging to look up information about um, voting locations and other policies as they change, um, especially if folks don't have access to the internet um, or uh, easy access to the internet on their phones. 
One additional dynamic here that I'll just mention before moving on um, is the impact of pandemic related location changes on elderly voters. So many neighborhood voting locations have been moved out of senior care facilities since uh, bringing in other people from the neighborhood, uh, entering the building, potentially bringing the virus with them is a significant health risk to an already at risk population. But that means that getting to a voting booth is now more challenging for elderly voters who are used to simply going down the hall for election day. Vote by mail is an okay solution here, uh, but it can be a complicated process to apply uh, for successfully and then receive the ballot. And some elderly voters, uh, many elderly voters require assistance to cast their ballot. Um, and in many states, uh, there are strict privacy laws that limit who can offer that assistance. Usually it's just a poll worker or potentially an immediate family member. That means that although healthcare workers might be the most accessible source of support, they may not legally be allowed to help. Um, and that creates a tricky situation um, and one that might get overlooked, but ensuring um, everyone can vote regardless of age is nonetheless an important issue that I just wanted to make sure I was raising up today. Staff is also a really key dynamic. Staffing dynamics are, are really important to the upcoming election. So election workers are the largest single day workforce in American life, period, any in, in any general election year. Um, and seasonal workers who might work for more than a couple of days, a couple of weeks or a couple of months around election day um, are also crucial for managing vote by mail and central counting facilities where all the ballots go at the end of the night. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, there have been profound reductions in uh, election workers uh, stepping up to serve um, and especially experienced election workers. So we're talking to some jurisdictions where they expect uh, two thirds to three quarters of their election workers uh, in the fall to be first time uh, election workers which is exciting in terms of bringing new people into the process. It's also really challenging because elections are complex to run. Um, and the more experienced election workers can be, the, the less likely they are to, um, the less likely voters are, are, are to run into issues um, on election day. So it's also important to note that uh, this issue with staffing can come on rapidly and unexpectedly. Um, so people are pulling out at the last minute. So an election official might feel like they have a full slate a week and a half before an election and then lose 50% of their staffing the week before with people calling, um, citing the pandemic as a reason to, to opt out of, of serving in that capacity. Um, so it's not just a challenge, it's a challenge that um, comes on pretty quickly. Um, the, the result is uh, trickle down impact on polling locations. If you don't have the people, you can't open the polling locations, um, which again limits access, um, creates those long lines um, and ends up disenfranchising voters um, who can't stick around to, to vote in a six hour line. Uh, in a second, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna talk about some, some interesting approaches to solving this problem, um, but I would just note uh, for everyone listening that the best way to learn about elections uh, is that you should be a poll worker. Um, there are still primaries and municipal elections leading up to election day. Um, and they serving as a poll worker is, is the, the best way to learn about um, the election process in the United States. Um, and they'd be lucky to have you, uh, anyone on this call. And at the very least, uh, election workers are people you should be hearing from um, their experience of how election day goes. So talking about poll workers, um, there are a lot of different and creative approaches that folks are taking um, to recruit enough poll workers to maintain uh, the standard in-person voting footprint for the general election. So that looks like partnerships with local public health offices and offices of emergency management. The Medical Reserve Corps, which was formed after 9-11, includes about 175,000 people across the country that volunteer to provide uh, service in the context of medical crises. Uh, folks are reaching out to veterans groups and in some cases working with active National Guard members. Um, there's some real challenges there, um, seeing uh, uniformed military adjacent uh, folks at the polls is, is not just bad optics, but it's, it's a really 
it is an example of what you would look for um, and try to prevent in, in an election um, anywhere in the world. So uh, when the National Guard is serving, they're uh, typically doing it in plain clothes and not interacting with voters directly, but managing some of the health uh, the health guidelines like uh, cleaning machines and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's a tricky it's a tricky balance to want to staff polling locations and then to have um, a kind of fraught option um, for doing that. In addition, uh, election departments are partnering with nonprofits where nonprofits will uh, get, a, get the staffing for an entire precinct, they'll adopt a precinct, and then uh, the money that those volunteers would have made as poll workers is then donated back to the nonprofit. So it can be a fundraiser. Um, and on the flip side, some companies um, are doing something similar, having their employees staff the polls and then having the money that uh, would go to um, those volunteers go to a charity of the company's choice. And of course, there's a lot of recruitment of students as well. This is one of my favorite um, types of civic programs. Um, when high school students are recruited to be poll workers, they're more likely to vote. Um, they uh, are more tech savvy than the average election worker. They're more likely to be bilingual or multilingual um, and able to support language access for people in their communities. Um, and they have the, the stamina and energy to, to work a 14 or 16 hour day, which is typically what an election worker is asked to do. Um, so it's really a win-win-win for, um, for the students, for the election office, for voters. Um, and so we're seeing more of that. Um, Minneapolis, Chicago, um, a number of other places have, have really robust student worker programs. Uh, so let's move on to stuff. If you'll excuse the uh, kind of casual catch-all name here. Um, Election offices need to access PPE and other risk mitiga mitigating tools, but sometimes aren't as tapped into the supply chains for healthcare uh, and other essential services. So there have been some challenges acquiring PPE. Um, this is also an example of increased costs to election officials. And even things like drive-through voting um, or curbside voting, which takes place at the precinct where a voter casts their ballot in their car when the ballot is provided by a poll worker or bipartisan team of poll workers who run out from the precinct to the car. Um, the, those, two, those two methods, drive-through voting um, or curbside voting um, require materials of their own. Um, so tents and signage, and in the case of curbside voting, some places use doorbells so that people can drive up, press the doorbell, and alert the poll workers inside to the need to uh, have a, a ballot brought out. Let's talk for a moment about systems. So we've talked about one already, and that's that the, the fact that um, the overall election infrastructure is extremely overburdened based on the pandemic and uh, was already overburdened based on cybersecurity concerns and other dynamics um, prior to the pandemic. So that makes everything harder. It's also true that um, through motor voter laws or automatic voter registration, um, some of the, the, the primary ways that voter registration records are updated in the US is through Department of Motor Vehicles, which have been on the whole shuttered over the last six months or so, um, or have limited capacity. And so what that means is that there's not just an issue uh, around absentee ballots or in-person voting, it's also an issue of voter registration, which is a little bit upstream. Um, and that can have a, a really serious impact. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then there's also just a lot of um, ways that these systems interact, right? So there's in-person vo voting, there's uh, mail balloting, and then what happens when someone shows up to the polls with their mail ballot and wants to submit it? Do they have to surrender it and vote a different ballot? Um, is there a Dropbox there for them? Um, does the ballot have to be destroyed? It's a, there, there are lots of options and it's just one example of sort of systems interacting in, in complex ways. Um, the, the one thing that I mentioned before we talk about automatic voter registration is that um, clerk's offices are seeing an, a, an enormous increase in the number of calls, quest, questions that they're getting from voters. Um, 
during the primaries and, and even beginning for the general election. Voters uh, concerned about in-person voting, uh, the pandemic, voting by mail, lots of questions about how to effectively fill out a ballot. Um, and some cities are, are even moving to call centers to have the ability to effectively staff um, all of those questions. Um, and I raise that up just because if you are a journalist looking to understand some of the questions that are coming from your community about the voting process, uh, working with local election officials and their call centers to understand where the, the primary questions are coming from might be an interesting way to speak to those needs um, in the context of the, the stories and the work that you're producing. Okay. So in terms of um, systems, more specifically automatic voter registration, um, major decreases, 50, 60, 70% around voter registration. Um, so what does that mean? In person, um, it means that uh, voters won't have been receiving educational and informational mailings from election offices. Um, and campaigns and get out the vote organizations also won't have accurate data. And so neither the election office nor third parties can help turn people out on election day. There'll be more same day registration on election day in states that allow that, uh, which is good, but it's also time consuming, increasing uh, the length of lines. And it will also mean more turned away voters who are not registered in the correct locations, um, which is something that no one wants to see. The impact for vote by mail um, is that folks won't receive request forms or automatically or be automatically mailed ballots to the right addresses. Um, and that pushes more people to utilize the in-person option. Um, and then they may not still be able to utilize that in-person option um, if their registration is out of date. So an important and, and potentially somewhat undercovered uh, dynamic. And then lastly, just wanted to highlight how all of this relates to key questions around voters. Um, there, there are big concerns about will voters get to vote at all? Um, will an individual voter who's running into any of these challenges, whether it's their polling location changing, it's health concerns, um, it's registration issues, um, will they actually make it through the challenging process, the, the several hurdles that it takes to actually cast a vote and have it be counted. Um, the, a changing process is one where trust needs to be rebuilt. Um, and, you know, we're talking about the transfer of power in the, the peaceful transfer of power in the most powerful nation in the history of the world. Um, and so trusting in that process is really important, but uh, the pandemic has really um, caused some folks to lose trust uh, in the process. And then of course, um, are we keeping people safe? Do voters get sick in the process of voting? Um, another key dynamic. Um, one other piece that I'll, I'll just call out briefly is that we, we don't know how this is, how in-person voting is gonna shake out in relationship to mask requirements. So this is an instance where there's sort of a potential clash of rights and laws. Um, where local jurisdictions and states are instituting mask requirements, um, but some voters don't want to comply um, and still vote. And so there's this tension between, can you let someone without a mask in to vote in a place where masks are required? Um, and there's not necessarily a clear legal approach. Um, so we're watching this closely. Um, you know, the, the image on the screen there is uh, the Secretary of State in Alabama um, noting that if folks are unable to vote because they're not wearing a mask, that that is cause for the, the election office to be sued um, and that folks should have the right to vote regardless of their, their um, use of a mask. So um, a, a big potential issue uh, that involves a lot of intersections of the pandemic and the election coming up this fall. Um, I'll also just add that it's mirrored by other clashes that we've, that we've seen um, between different sets of, of laws, um, including when police officers in DC ordered people in line to vote to disperse due to a curfew order, even though the polls were still open. Um, so again, that's that dynamic of there's, there's rules coming from all directions um, and uh, voters are caught in the middle. Really briefly before we open it up for questions, um, just wanted to reference this uh, resource for every state called the Healthy Voting Guides. Um, it's produced 
collaboratively by the American Public Health Association, the Center for Civic Design, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, We Can Vote, and uh, CTCL, where I work. Um, the goal is to provide voters with updated, accurate information with links to official local and state websites. Um, it includes healthy voting tips, that are based on guidance from state and local agencies, the CDC and other best practices um, and interviews with public health experts. Um, this screenshot is from the Virginia page. Um, if a voter in Virginia wants to see how to vote in person um, and do that in a healthy way, um, this is, this is a great place to find that information. And it may also be a useful resource to provide to readers um, and other consumers of your of your work uh, who are interested in getting the facts about um, what in-person voting looks like. So with that, uh, I will open up the conversation. Uh, John, I don't know if you want to take over here if folks have questions or if you have questions um, and we'll chat for a minute um, about the topic. All right, awesome, awesome. Just... Um, and the website. Sorry to interrupt uh, your, your wrap up there. Oh, no, it's all good. Uh, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, and uh, you all, uh, Josh uh, is a, a resource uh, to, to you all now. You see his contact information there. Um, reach out to him. Uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can reach out to him. Um, if, you know, you maybe want to follow up on um, in his presentation. Um, and also, um, like I said, his presentation will be available um, on our uh, website um, and, his, um, and his slide deck uh, will also be available. Uh, so if you all want to go back um, and take a look at that, uh, please feel free. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you everybody for uh, hanging out uh, uh, on a uh, Wednesday afternoon. And uh, yeah, uh, we will uh, see you all at the next one. Uh, appreciate you. Have a good one. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. All right, y'all. Take care.